If we're at higher altitudes when we encounter a severe air mass event caused by convective activity or perhaps mountain wave, our response to the airplane sinking should be different than the escape maneuver. Since the ground is not a threat, aircraft control should take precedence over loss of altitude. We should keep the angle of attack on the wing well inside the envelope by unloading, rather than fly at or near stick shaker alpha in an attempt to maintain altitude. I know we are all concerned about other air traffic and the potential for a midair. However, wouldn't you rather be under control when your TCAS issues an advisory? That's something called a wind field diagram. This came out of the uh, Charlotte microburst accident. Last year, Charlotte US Air, MD-80 guy at Charlotte. Uh, there was a lot of interesting stuff in this NTSB accident report, but I thought this one would be the most useful for you. Uh, this wind field diagram is created after the fact from numerous data points. It's considered to be reasonably accurate. It will show us the sheer power and magnitude of this microburst. Okay, all these little arrows are the wind direction. This is done at 300 feet AGL. Uh, I don't relate well to meters. I don't know about you. This is all meters all around here. So for dimension, let's use the airport. This is the Charlotte Airport. That's a 10,000 foot runway right there for dimension purposes. This red line is the ground track of that MD-80. The MD-80 is right here when this microburst hits the ground. He is right here when he hits the ground, okay? This microburst is 30 seconds into its life. I didn't know this. Did you guys and gals know that the average life of a microburst is eight minutes? Eight minutes from the time the downshaft hits the ground and goes out till it's gone. How do you anticipate something like that? How do you predict it? See? In my opinion, these poor guys are just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they're right here when this thing hits the ground right in front of him. This microburst you're looking at is 30 seconds into its life. I'm going to advance this slide in time increments of less than two minutes. I'm going to hold my light at the point where he enters this microburst. Now, I want you to watch this puppy grow, okay? I'm going to hold it at the point where he enters it as best I can. Now, watch this. Bang. Two minutes later. A little less than two minutes later. Look at that thing grow. Now, watch this. A little less than two minutes after that. Look at that thing. That's a 10,000 foot runway. This is a serious air mass event. Well, what happens? Well, he meets this thing, as you can see, coming at him half as fast as he's going at it. The result of that is, as you enter a microburst, the first thing that happens is you enter a headwind. When you enter a headwind and when you're flying, as long as you've got your hands on the controls, even with the autopilot on, as long as you've got your hands on the controls, what's going to happen? Well, the yoke's going to go forward, and these puppies are going to go backward. And you're going to be sitting in there like, I don't usually sit in here like this, you know. Which is kind of your first clue bird, isn't it? Your first clue bird, that something's going awry here. They got the clue bird early on. And, uh, and made a timely decision uh, to get out of there. And essentially, what you watch going on, though, is a kind of a go-around. And, and so as they go through that process, they do fairly well as they, as they work their way through the headwind portion. And then, as you can see, the next thing that happens is they enter the downburst portion. The air is coming down, this vertical shaft, and then going out. As they enter the downburst portion, of course, they take up a sink. Now, this crew aggressively fought that sink. They did a pretty good job, and they stopped it before they got to the ground, and stabilized. But then, you see, no matter which way you turn out of the downburst, you must enter a tailwind. In this accident, they, the, the wind factor, uh, tailwind factor takes 38 knots off the airspeed indicator, and they lower the nose. Shortly thereafter, they enter the ground on speed. On speed. Let me say right up front, these two pilots may be the best two pilots on the planet, and probably are. I don't personally know them. However, if you are not trained to fly the way we're talking about right now, how can we possibly expect you to do this out there in the real world when it happens? Okay, let's look at another microburst accident, because it's going to teach us some more things about performance. 
This is a video of a microburst accident that happened at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Uh, it's a Delta 191 coming in to land. Coming in to land at Dallas-Fort Worth. This will be a little clearer when we get it going here. It'll brighten up a bit. I just took clippets out of that film. Okay. Uh, the first clippets will show you the crash site here by the tanks. This guy is trying to land to the south on what was then 17 left at DFW. I will take some clippets of the crash site uh, taken from a helicopter and then the tower cam, and then we'll take some clippets of the weatherman in Dallas Fort Worth. Listen to the weatherman saying there were essentially no clouds over the airport when this guy comes over Blue Ridge. I mean, how could he decide not to start this approach? Listen to the weatherman saying, I didn't even see this on my Doppler radar till 10 minutes after the crash. Listen to that stuff first, the weather stuff. Tower Delta 557, Suzy, final 17 left. Where's the crash track? They're coming. Report of a heavy jet just crashed off the north end of the airport. Rest carefully moved the rest, putting their bodies on stretchers and taking them a distance from the main crash site. According to officials, the Delta jet was en route nonstop from Fort Lauderdale to DFW Airport and was to go on to Los Angeles. Most unusual because 15 minutes before 6 o'clock, we had looked at the radar and there was nothing there. I mean, this was a rapidly built up thunderstorm. It came up very, very quickly. And as it did, we caught it with the Channel 8 Precision Radar. This is actually about 10 minutes after the time of the reported crash. And you can see there was a most intense thunderstorm indicated by the red area right over the east side runways, the Dallas County side runways of DFW Airport, and right at the precise location where that crash occurred. We can take this shot up just a little bit closer, and as we do, you can see this core area of red and then the little flecks of white. At the particular angle the radar was at, that would in indicate a very heavy downpour of rain in that particular area. There may have been hail, and we've heard reports of lightning. We did some minor Doppler analysis, and quite frankly, it happened so quickly we didn't see a lot, but we saw no significant rotation from the National Weather Service radar in Stephenville, and as we follow the motion, there is the storm. It just died away within about a half an hour another storm over Fort Worth was gone and then there was some out west and tonight there's nothing left let me say that I've traveled around the country talking to all our pilots I was not personally there that day how I have met many of our crews that were that day as I've done this program and all of the stories they tell corroborate one and another two of the best ones I think are as I had the captain and the co-pilot from the airplane that was two ships behind this Delta in other words, the Delta, an airplane, our guy. And on two different meetings, both the captain and the co-pilot said the same thing, and that was they had no incentive to do anything but come in and land. They could see a little rain shower there, you know. They could see through it to the runway. The bases were up at 6,000. They were coming in to land. No reason to do otherwise when this guy splashes right in front of them. The guy on 1-8 right said the same thing. I had another captain that was number one for takeoff on 1-7 right, you know, 90 to the runway, looking toward the tanks. He's planning on taking off as soon as he gets a clearance. He has no incentive to do otherwise when this delta splashes right in front of him. Now, he said eight seconds later, his entire airplane was rocking on its legs, and with the parking brakes parked, the airspeed said 75 knots. This is an insidious event. It's going to happen sometimes. OK. As we go through this, uh, we're going to do it twice. What we got here is two runs at this. Both of them will have the body angles. Uh, both of them will have the body angles of the airplane visible. And in the first run in this block, you will have the CVR data printed as you hear it audibly. On the next run, you'll have the body angles visible, but in this block, you'll have all the DFDR performance instruments. On the first run, what I want you to uh, do is uh, listen to what's being said and read it. I want you to tell me if you see a fugoid-type mode maneuver occur when it occurs. And tell me, why did that happen? Yes, sir, 
Did you see a fugoid? Yeah. It starts at 650 feet, so he's got plenty of altitude, and he's out of it again at 250. I mean, that didn't get him. You know, he had enough altitude to work it through. But did you see why it started? See why? Yeah, exactly. What's my V-ref? It turns out it's the co-pilot talking to himself, the first officer, who is flying the airplane, and he says, uh, he, he, he says what's my V-ref? And he looks down and sees his speed about 8 or 10 knots low, and he pushes the yoke forward, and that starts it. I know that because I can time in control column position for the same second. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to look, I'm only going to do this once, so you will not have time to watch everything. Do not try to watch the wind field vector. Don't try to watch control column position. Don't try to watch EPR. I will tell you right now, if you were watching EPR, you would see that the pilots got full power on these engines. You will also see that subsequently, the auto throttles will retard the power, in this case due to a high speed cue. Don't let that happen. Up and off until you're done with them. What I want you to watch on this run is the body angles of the airplane and these two things, AOA and airspeed. I hope at this point you will agree with me, airspeed is energy, and AOA is lift. And we're going to watch energy and lift play out in this scenario. On the energy indicator, we have the V-ref for the airplane right here, and then 10 knot increments. Right now he's about plus 15. On the lift indicator over here, we have an analog angle of attack in indication, and uh, that bar right there is stick shaker alpha, what we know as CL max, okay? And then 24 under the 25, that would be stall alpha or flow separation. By the way, is this interesting to you? The flight data recorder has an analog angle of attack indicator. And further, the NTSB says that one of the channels on our airplanes must be angle of attack indication. Because after all, when we go to investigate an accident, how can we possibly tell what happened if we can't see angle of attack? <laughs> Think about that. Isn't that interesting? All corporate jets fly with it. Now all military aircraft fly with it. And we can't see it clearly. We have some tools, but we can't see it clearly. Now let me tell you something, the NTSB is with us. They are recommending they should be in all airplanes. Okay, uh, what we're going to do then is watch energy and lift play out, okay? And at the end of this scenario, I'm going to ask you, did, these, did this crew extract anywhere near all of the energy or all of the lift in this scenario? Here we go. Plus 25, he's doing real good. Yes, sir, right around the corner, we're hitting number one. Major one, take six, contact. Gotta lose it all of a sudden. There it is. Push it up. Push it way up. 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 Way I'm going to freeze this here at 50 feet. 
I'm going to ask you two questions. Is there any energy in this airplane? Is there any lift left on this wing? You know, there is no harm, no foul on this crew. There really isn't. I mean, do you see how purely fast this happens to them? You see how quick that happened? If you're trying to fly by some conventional cross-check and a conventional means with no one clearly identifying to you how fast the ground is coming, rest their souls, I'd be there too. But if one pilot were purely focused on extracting all the lift out of this wing and the other were purely focused on how he's doing relative to the ground, our non-engineering study shows that this plane would have never come below 500 feet AGL. If you should encounter a microburst on departure or on approach, it may require you to extract maximum performance from your airplane. The microburst training you receive in the simulator will be both challenging and rewarding. It should prepare you as a crew working together to successfully escape from this powerful and potentially catastrophic air mass anomaly. Thank you.